Good morning. Thank you everybody for joining us. My name is Lynn O'Hara and I'm the Director of Programs at National History Day. I'm so excited to be joined today by Jen Rydell, who is the teacher in residence at the Library of Congress this year. So she gave up teaching for a year to come to Washington and work at the library. And she's going to talk about some of the projects she's worked on and some ideas that she has for your classroom. Mm -hmm. And Ashley DeBraccio from NHD is here. She's joining us to be in charge of the question box. What we want to do is kind of take the same format we've done before. We're going to look at strategies, we're going to look at resources, and then we're going to focus on your questions. So if you're watching on a desktop or laptop, you've got access to a question box. Put them in at any time. If you are watching on mobile device, maybe you're on your phone or a tablet, if you don't have a question box, you can send us questions through Twitter. Rick Stoddard, our Director of Communications, is live on there. And just please use the hashtag NHD2020 and he'll feed questions our way too. One thing to keep in mind, because we're talking about exceptional learners, so gifted and talented students with learning disabilities, students on the autistic spectrum, please keep in mind that we want to keep our questions general in nature. We won't voice or can't answer a question about any particular student because obviously we don't know that student and we're not in a place to do that. What we can do though is give you overall strategies. We can give you some resources and our goal is to really generate your ideas. You mm -hmm. know your students the best, you know what they need and hopefully we'll give you some ideas to help you work with them for the next couple of weeks. All right, so I'm gonna focus here and kind of begin on talking about working with supports for all students. And this is something where, as I was a classroom teacher before I came to NHD, and kind of by the end of my career, I kind of ended up specializing in the two extremes. So my high flyer, gifted and talented AP students, but then also on my co-taught, English as a second language, um, learning disabilities. If there's something strange just about your overall profile, you tended to end up in my class. I don't know how magically the guidance counselors managed to make that happen. And what I actually found in teaching is that I would start creating things for some of my special learners. And actually, I would find that they actually can benefit all learners. Whether or not they needed them, having them available was a resource that really helped with my class. So what I thought I would do is throw out some suggestions of some things that I've picked up that I think might help you in this situation. All right. I think the best way to think about this is think about how you support your students in your live classroom. And then let's figure out how to transition as much of that that's feasible to the online environment. So one thing, we know in a classroom that repetition is really important, right? You give a direction, then you might restate the direction, you might go check in with a particular student or group of students, have them repeat it back to you. And we can't do all of that. But I wanna think about things we can do. So if you're giving directions, maybe you can make a short video or a short audio file. I'm thinking like a minute, maybe two minutes max. This could be something that students could play and then potentially play again or repeat as needed. Um, this is also the kind of thing where you want to think about those challenges, right? You can't give a quiz, but maybe you can give a challenge and you can do as many times as you can until you get it right or until you hit a certain benchmark. This is also a good thing because we're thinking about the idea of repetition. Think about old models, something that you use that has worked. Maybe it's a particular type of graphic organizer or a certain type of activity that your students responded well to. If you can take that and apply that organizer or that strategy to, to a new content, that's going to help students because they're familiar with it. And you might even remind them like, hey, we did this back in February. Remember, put up a sample. Now we're going to take this and apply it to our new unit that we're looking at. I think it's important that if you're going to verbalize directions, you also give them in written form. That's going to be really important for your learners because they don't have the kind of reinforcements that you might have in your classroom, like the directions written on the board or projected onto the board. Um, I think when you're writing your instructions, take a minute and reread them. You know how at NHD projects when we're helping students get under the word count and we help them tighten up their language, oftentimes they end up with something that's better written. Same deal here. If you can help simplify your directions, they're gonna be much easier to follow. Think also about multiple formats. If you've gotta provide a longer written piece for students to read, are there options on how they read it? So for example, is there an audio option? Um, 
if you're using something that other people use, check out YouTube. You might be surprised at what you can find there. Maybe you can record it. Maybe you can work with a colleague where you record one reading and they record another one. If you've got a college student who's home and has some time on their hands, maybe they can help you in creating that kind of a file because that would give your students the option. They could read, they could listen, or they could read while they listen. And that can be a real help, especially to students who are English language learners. I think it's really important if you're doing an activity that has a sequence, you've got to make the sequence clear. This is step one. Don't go on to step two till you finish step one. This is one, this is two, this is three. Make it even bigger and bolder than you would in a classroom. You know, a big giant blue letter can be really, really helpful. I think too, whenever you can give students choice, you've got to do something. We know you may not want to do it, but you got to do A, B, or C. Make them equivalent, but then the students feel like they have some kind of control. If you're working with students on the autism spectrum, a couple things to keep in mind. Routines are really important to these students. You know that in the classroom. So anything you can do to create a routine that gets repeated either in the online environment, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, that can be really helpful for those students. Uh, when you're doing something longer, provide breaks and provide direction. Like, hey, we're gonna take a two minute break and everybody's gonna stand up and stretch because we've been staring at this computer screen for 20 minutes straight now. Um, I think whatever you can give sensory breaks or little activities that students can do, I think that's also helpful. If you're working in an integrated classroom setting and you have students on the autistic spectrum and you're attempting any kind of breakout groups or group work, go check on that group early and often. You know as a teacher, if you split into group work, you know when you set off those groups, which groups you're gonna visit first or hang out near or lean over their desk. You know, all of those physical proximity cues that we use to help our students, replicate that as much as you can online. Um, that's also, if you are working with a paraeducator or a special educator, co-teacher, or anything like that, if they can come in and they get assigned to go check in with that group first, and then you can come in a little later, that can be really helpful. For our gifted and talented learners, they need pathways. They need things to explore. The basic assignments are gonna get old for them pretty quickly. Um, one thing with these students, really watch their anxiety levels because oftentimes many of these students are getting into mindsets about, you know, this is gonna ruin my chances. I'm never gonna go to college. I'm never gonna have a job. The world's coming to an end. And I think it's really important that we remind those students, we are all in this boat together. Nobody planned this. Yes, this is the situation for you right now in Florida, but it's also the situation for the students in Maine and in California and in Montana and in Texas. We're all figuring it out, but at the end, it's gonna be okay because we have the big end goals and we know as teachers, we can get you there. When you're working with students who have case managers or special educators who work with them, do your best to keep them in the loop. That's really important because they will do their best to help you. Uh, and a lot of times we have communication with these people in a very informal way, right? You might check in with them while you're on cafeteria duty. I know it's like the pit of all school duties is cafeteria duty, in my opinion. Uh, you might also check in with them, you know, as you're walking down the hall or on the way to a faculty meeting. So you've got to kind of make that extra effort to send the text, shoot the email, make a phone call to say, hey, you know, I'm really struggling with this student. Can you give me a call this afternoon so we can strategize how best to work with them? When you're working with parents, proactive advanced communication is the key. Whenever it's possible and whenever it's appropriate, I would always encourage, especially with older learners, that you talk to the student and parent together. Make sure we're all on the same page. There's not three versions of the story floating around keep that special educator either copied on the email, invite them into the phone call or the conference call or the team meeting or Zoom meeting or any kind of electronic communication you might be having. Document supports. You can't always control whether a student takes a support, but you can document that a support has been offered. And I think that that is helpful. So if it's, hey, you know, we have a practice activity that gets you ready for the lesson. Did you try it? Oh, did you try it once? But, you know, I saw that you logged in, but you only logged in for five seconds and then you hit submit. What if we try it again and give it five minutes? 
Uh, so make sure you're keeping track of that. All right, we're doing everything we can to support teachers. Two kind of quick shout outs. Our historical argumentation webinar series where we're featuring Library of Congress resources. Uh, we've actually had a lot of interest in this and we're really excited about that. If you are interested in applying for a full scholarship, May 1st is the deadline. So nhd.org slash pd. Please go ahead and sign up for that. Uh, we're gonna cut it off on the first and then start working to allot those scholarships out. So if you're interested, get those applications in. Honestly, it's a 10 minute application. This is not super involved. Uh, we wanna know who you are and what you wanna learn out of this. And then our classroom, our online education courses, those you have until June 10th to sign up for summer session. We also have fall session there. So check those out if that's something you think will be interesting or helpful to you. The one good thing we've all gotten a little bit back is some time. While our time has been allocated very differently, a lot of teachers are taking advantage and saying, hey, you know what? I've always wanted to do this and now my trip got canceled. So you know what? I'm gonna buckle down and learn because it's only gonna benefit you and your students when you get back to them. And I know you wanna get back to them. All right, talking about teachers who wanna get back to students. I'm gonna do a quick transition here and introduce Jim Rydell. Uh, I met Jen uh, very early in the school year as she started her program as the teacher in residence and been working with her through different pathways and we've connected at some conferences. And when we started talking about setting this up, I was like, hey, Jen's the person I've gotta to try to get from the LOC to join us in this crazy adventure. So Jen, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So gotcha. you can go ahead, share your screen. And tell okay. us about who you are, what you do at the library, what this crazy adventure has been like, and what tips and resources you can offer our teachers who are working with their variety of exceptional learners. So I'm stopping talking. Thanks, Jen. Sounds great. Well, first of all, I just, um, I'm very honored to be with you. And everything I'm sharing is from my experience, both of, in a, as a classroom teacher, before getting to land at the library this school year. Um, I'm from Bellingham, Washington, two hours north of Seattle in the Bellingham School District. Shout out to Options High School, which is an alternative public high school. I worked there for four years and part of that worked 19 years in a traditional high school and kind of like Lynn, uh, taught, taught AP, taught at grade level and taught struggling learners uh, literacy and pretty much anything they told me to teach. My passion is civics and law which led me to apply for this year's teacher in residence. They were looking for civics teachers. And ultimately what I do is I try to help in any projects the department has on teacher trainings, help find materials that I think uh, would represent some type of civics principles and help students or teachers deliver those to students. Um, done a lot of other things, but I got to meet a lot of the partners that uh, work with the library like National History Day. So. It's been a head spinning year, despite how COVID has rained on that parade. Um, but I'm excited to be here to share with you some things that I think might help exceptional learners. And in my definition, much like Lynn's, is very deep and wide. And so while uh, most of my career has been teaching, I'd say at grade level and even struggling kids, I, of course, I had lots of high flyers that were excited to learn and came to me ready to go. So I'm going to share with you some, some tips that I hope will help you navigate the library's offerings to you. So the first thing that I want to tell you is um, you need to remember that not everything at the library is digitized. Um, and so because of that, uh, you might stumble upon something that looks phenomenal for your class, but you can't use it because you'll see a tiny little thumbnail. And that just means you have to be on site. Everything I'm highlighting today is completely free of copyright restrictions, so you should be able to access it. So you might remind students, particularly you history day researcher teachers, that when they get frustrated that they really want to go for digital collections that are free of any limitation. Um, another thing as you start to think, how can I dig into the richness of the collections? Not everything's cataloged in the way you intuitively might believe it to be. It's cataloged the way the archivist receives it. And so sometimes in different time periods and eras, different words are used to mean things. So you have to get creative. For those of you that are in my age group or older, you probably used a card catalog uh, in your collegiate experience or maybe um, a little bit younger. And so we were our own Google. So you have to think, what would be different phrases or synonyms I might find resources under? And then um, I just think that as you and students are navigating um, the resources, 
it's probably best, despite whether you have a high flyer student or one that needs some supports, you do some of the gathering and curating and give them some of those tips, whether that be in Flipgrid or whether you're doing a screencast-o-matic, whatever it might be right now. But you help them until they get uh, kind of used to the library offerings. So the first thing I want to point you to is are the primary source sets. And basically, if you can see there on the left, we have loc.gov teachers. This needs to be your happy place. You're gonna land there. And um, if all of my hyperlinks work, we will go there. And at loc.gov teachers, you'll see that this section here, teachers home, classroom materials is where you wanna hover. And then you would go to primary source sets. So these are, I'm we have about sorry, 25. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanna let you know, we're still seeing your PowerPoint slide not necessarily your browser slide. Well, that's not fun. <laughs> okay, well, I'll go back to my, I'll stick to the pre-done PowerPoint. Sorry, audience land. Okay, is that better? We're good now. Okay, sorry, I won't go rogue. You all can be capable of going to the website yourself. So when you go there, you're going to see primary source sets. And we have about 25, 30 of them. And these sets cover uh, a variety of different types of topics and then formats within them. So I pulled up Japanese internment, American internment, and it has about 18 different items in it. There's a teacher's guide you can see there, which I won't dare to click on because I want to stay on this slide. And that teacher's guide gives you some background. So this is a topic your students are not as familiar with. It'll give you some historical context. And then it also gives you some teaching ideas. And when I've gone through these teacher's guides now with the idea of asynchronous learning, they do have some good ideas that I think you can easily modify for independent work for students. So the teacher's guide can become your friend in terms of helping students access these. Um, and so when you go to these, you'll also see, so above we have seen there's the teacher's guide here. There's also the analysis tool guides. And some of you, and I have heard Lynn mention them before in her presentations, some of them of you have used these. And these are dedicated guides that would help you uh, and help your students analyze specific types of primary sources. So you can see here under the Japanese American internment, that first one is a naval dispatch. And that's actually the naval dispatch that says Pearl Harbor has been attacked. So you would want to help students figure out how do they analyze that? That looks like this, the primary source analysis tool. And when you go to that page, we have, this tool can be used uniformly with any type of primary source, maps, manuscripts, uh, photos, sheet music. And by the way, you need to check out sheet music because there's some crazy sheet music that identifies different uh, events in historical time periods. So you can go to these and the primary source analysis tool for teachers gives you, the teacher types, some specific questions to prompt students. And you might use those questions to have kids do independent analysis. I would imagine that if you took kids to, for independent work, these um, primary source sets, you might assign, you might say, depending on what teaching you've pri previously done, hey, choose three to four different primary sources. And I would like you to do a primary source analysis for each one of these. And depending on your student ability, for your students that can just jump into this, maybe you step it up and you say, I don't just want you to analyze photos. I want you to try to look at a manuscript, a photo, and maybe um, a map. So they have a variety of different primary sources to inform their understanding of the topic. So, the next thing that I want us to think about is, and the, some of you might know about the WPA slave narratives, and at the library, it's titled Born into Slavery. Um, this collection is phenomenal, and some of you who are familiar with it know it has limitations, but I actually think those limitations are teachable moments, and even in this asynchronous world, you can, you can use these, um, for, particularly for students that are able and kind of ready to go. So I'd recommend that when you go to this uh, Born into Slavery into the site, there's information about the collection. So really recommend that you read that as the teacher type before you're giving students any instructions. The next thing I would suggest is I was able to uh, tap into Teaching Tolentia's uh, Teaching Hard History episode. I think it's at 11 when I checked it out. 
using the WPA slave narratives. Phenomenal information and tips of how to use them, how to use the silences in them, how to look at the language that the interviewee is, is giving and the, the clues they're giving about uh, their experience as, as, a, as an enslaved person. And so I think if you, the team, this could be a really powerful independent project for kids or maybe a couple kids working together. But if you do the due diligence ahead of time, which I know you've got minimal bandwidth, and you read about the collection, listen to teaching tolerances tips, and then you um, might even send kids to one of those primary source sets, specifically Jim Crow and uh, segregation. And that helps set the scene for what many of the individuals are speaking about in the narratives. And then finally, if you were to use these with students, um, I really recommend that you don't have the students choose the narrative, that maybe you do the, that selection. And, and once they and you are familiar with it, then after that fact, you might encourage them to investigate somebody else to learn about and their experiences. Um, something else a little bit lighter to think about how you could get kids um, that can kind of take their own initiative or even kids that need a little support. These are free to use and reuse resources and these are free of any copyright. You're never gonna find, in fact, you can make your gift cards from these if you'd like. There are a lot of fun topics and lighthearted um, topics, but there's also things like uh, World War I posters. There's a poster parade that I'm kind of a fan of right now that it highlights different um, kind of public service announcements. And it tells you to brush your teeth or it tells you to practice hygiene. But I wonder if you could use that poster parade and prompt students to look at it, to kind of figure out what was going on in society that these were the public service announcement messages. And then maybe encourage students to consider what type of public service uh, poster parade images might they create in this moment in time whether it be COVID oriented, whether it be encouraging a kind and a good society, whatever it might be. So I, I really encourage you to check those out. Again, some a lot of light topics, but also some serious ones that of civil rights and war that, that we all teach. Um, some of you might have had the opportunity to learn about, and if you haven't, I'm excited to share it with you. Uh, the LOC has the By the People, which is a crowdsourced transcription project. And what they've done is created a pretty easy to use, if you spend, I'd say 15, 20 minutes as the educator, pretty easy to use platform to send students to of letting the students do the work of historians. So what they get to do is they go into the transcription projects and you can see here, I have a screenshot of the Blackwells, which was a family dedicated to both suffrage and abolition of slavery. And you can go into all of those scanned digital images of the papers and the manuscripts. And then what you as the transcriber do is you can do the work of transcription. You can do the reviewing of what somebody else has done as that work is being transcribed. And the neat thing for students is once you get this set up, kids get to practice historical work. This isn't like they're doing this just to do something in class to fill the time. They're actually contributing to the power of these collections of the Library of Congress and really for posterity in American history. So find a collection that you think meets the needs of your students, what you've already taught, or you know, if you have freedom, just let the kids go loose, set loose. There's a um, resources for educators page that I'd really recommend you look at. It has some tips of how to use them, some, some cautions. There's not too much to be worried about, but this is a fun way to get kids to thinking about the powerful historical um, strategies and skills we want them to have of thinking about, you could ask them to transcribe something and then have to do maybe a short written response of that experience. What was it like to be in the position of a transcriber? What questions did you have about the individual? What did you need to know about the context of the historical period that this manuscript was part of? So that, that's a fun thing. I, I, there's so much to share with you at the library and I feel like I'm already a fire hose, but I wanted to choose some things that I think that are relatively ready to go that with your knowledge and your understanding of your student needs, you could, you could give them access and hopefully have some engaging and powerful experiences. If anything I've said has uh, really kind of lit a fire in you and but you're still not sure, please, please, please email me. You can see the emails there at jrydell.loc.gov. We do have a lot of other resources, but I've highlighted some of the biggies. I'd recommend you play with our blog 
that's also on that teacher's page. And if you choose to, and you sign up twice a week, we uh, send out blogs highlighting primary sources and give you a few ideas of how you might use those with kids. We're trying to keep those pretty relatively easy to implement in our remote learning environment. And then the last thing I'll mention before I turn back over to Lynn and company and hopefully get to interact with all of you is that we at the library, in addition to offering webinars about every two weeks on different topics, we did a civics one two weeks ago. We did one for science and civics and literacy and primary sources this week. We're doing weekly what we're calling online office hours. Basically, it's a demo of something we have we think might be helpful for educators. You drop in about 15, 20 minutes of a demo, and then the rest of the time is meant for questions. So really encourage you, all of it's free. And again, if you wanna follow, we, we do a lot of promotion on Twitter at Teaching LC. So if you wanna see what's coming up, and then if you wanna follow me at Civics Girl on Twitter, I try to post a lot of things that the library offers. So I am going to share, stop my sharing and give it back to Lynn. Alrighty, well, thank you so much. I think these are cool sources. I will mention, I know a student in Iowa got very excited by the Women's Suffrage Project because cool. Carrie Chapman Cat is actually from Iowa. So she not only got involved in it, but it organized a whole huge group of students to do that as a service learning day project. That's, that's cool. Kind of a cool thing because you can get involved, it's community service and it's history. And it's also learning about the importance of the archives and the libraries and the ways that we protect our history over time. Mm -hmm. So. All right, we've thrown some ideas at you, we've thrown some strategies at you, but we know that you have questions. So what we have, one quick note, uh, there's a raise hand feature in Zoom. We don't use that. Please don't raise your hand, just go straight to the question box and ask your question. Otherwise, you're gonna be just standing there the whole time. And we don't want that. So Ashley, do we have any questions in the queue of things that people would like to know about? Oh, Ashley, I'm sorry, you are muted. I am muted. Uh, I am waiting for one teacher to respond back to one of my questions. So check the chat box and make sure I haven't sent you a question to kind of develop that a little bit more. But also I have one that just came through. Um, any ideas on using these fantastic resources for our ancient and world history teachers out there? How you can kind of utilize the Library of Congress when you're on that kind of the so that, yeah, I guess, um, and, and full disclosure, I've really taught, when I've taught world history, it's probably been more contemporary world history. We don't tend to have, and every institution that has rich offerings has things and then they have limitations, so I'm not going to lie. We don't have curated sets that would be world history, so I'm sorry to say that. But what I do recommend is, if you know particular events in world history that you're going to teach or a theme, that likely possibly some primary sources have been cataloged under. So any world war, we're going to have things. We have, um, I didn't even highlight it, we have Chronicle in America, which is our digitized newspaper um, database that chronicles from 1789 until 1963. And we also have librarians have done some curated sets within that. So there are world events that are in that. If you go to the teacher's blog, and you look up, we have some on the, we have archive topics. I know uh, someone, my predecessor as a teacher in residence, he was a world history teacher and he did write blogs that I think he's done the work and you can dig into that. So I'm sorry, I'm not giving you like a golden, here's 25 sources, but if you are struggling on finding something, please email me and I will work as best I can to try to help you. One thing too I've noticed is that sometimes, you know, trends in history tend to come back. So mm -hmm. like ancient Egypt and the pyramids, well, with the discovery of King Tut's tomb by Harold Carter in the 1920s, there's becomes this huge rage, both mm -hmm. in Britain and in America, about things that are Egyptian. So everything from, it affects clothing styles and architecture styles. Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously, it's an issue that's very debatable because a lot of nations came in and took out treasures that are now exist in museums all over the world. Mm -hmm. But sometimes if you can think about when these issues come back up, then something like Chronicling America can be a really cool resource to show mm -hmm. you, okay, we're looking at these events that happened thousands of years ago, but you know, a hundred years ago, this was back in, here's what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. I need a newspaper article to help show that. But you're right, there are limitations with all of our partners because every organization has to define its boundaries. And this is what we do and this is what we collect. Can I just mention for the world history, uh, yeah. and you might already know about this, but 
a phenomenal resource and a partner that receives some funding from the library is the Stanford Historical Educational Group. Mm -hmm. And and I'm sure whoever asked the question, knowing them, they probably know about this. But if you haven't checked into their world history lessons that are oriented around particular primary sources of events and concepts, I would get yourself in there and maybe use that as a starting point. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend um, maps from the Library of Congress, um, especially if you're going ancient, they do have those available. They also have some digitized collections that are available centering around um, Americans who travel abroad. So if you're looking for kind of their interpretations of Europe, those are available digitally in the Library of Congress. And um, anything that's, that deals with world fairs or world expos, that um, because Americans do travel and do present on that, they will have those other uh, perspectives available in the Library of Congress archives as well. Okay, so hopefully that gave you something to tag on to. I hope we've given you a little something. All right, Ashley, what else do we have? Who else is in the queue? All right, let's see. I'm going to direct some of these um, questions towards you, Lynn, next. Okay. Uh, Christina is, uh, she works at a culinary themed high school in Patterson, New Jersey, and cool. she was to know if um, there are any recipes that mm -hmm. anyone knows of and any collections that can be analyzed historically. So Jenna, if you've got any as well from the Library of Congress that you know of, please. You can go them. first, Lynn, if you have some ideas. All right. A lot of the stuff that I'm familiar with in terms of food history tends to come out in uh, wartime rationing cookbooks. Mm -hmm. World War I and World War II rationing recipes are very mm -hmm. easy to find, especially where you're talking about you know, limiting or eliminating goods that were hard to get or were expensive, mm -hmm. sugar or lard or butter, uh, or things that were rationed. Um, that's a really interesting pathway. I would also check Chronicling America, mm -hmm. the, the kind of the style sections in newspapers. I think you could find some really interesting recipes kind of buried in there. Um, I also would say there's a lot of cool stuff. The Smithsonian has done some neat mm -hmm. It's based around cooking. They have Julia Child's Kitchen at the Museum of American History. So those will be places I would send you. Jen, what about other suggestions within the LOC universe? You know, I had seen, uh, just that came through the staff, we get all these different blogs from different parts mm -hmm. of the library and the science, the business science and technology reading room, they had done a bunch of blogs on, it, it's kind of what you're talking about, Lynn, it's anchored with uh, Great Depression and how people had to modify cooking with scarce resources. And so that was kind of fun. They highlighted, they had scanned digitally some cookbooks, but they had recipes. Um, actually, there's, if you can go to the um, Shall Not Be Denied Suffrage ex Exhibition Online, I'm pretty sure this is one of the scanned items. There's a suffragette cookbook. And it, in between cool. the, the recipes, yeah, it has real <laughs> recipes, but it also has like a real snarky recipe of a real suffragette uh, gives a dash of wit to her husband. And it has a list of all these little sarcastic one-liners that I just, I took a picture of because I loved it. So I'd recommend that. I, I echo Lynn in Chronically in America and something super fun for um, a historical connection. If you go to the Rosa Parks papers online in the online exhibition, Rosa Parks had written on the back of an envelope her feather light pancake recipe. And you, it actually, many, many people in the library and schools have made her feather light pancake recipe. It has peanut butter in it. So um, yeah, if you go to it, you'll find it. And I think that would be really fun as a nice uh, light entry point into Rosa Parks and then, especially if it sounds like you're a project-based learning school with interdisciplinary focus. So I would look at the science technology um, re reading room, uh, Chronicling America, and then Rosa Parks paper for the pancake recipe. One thing that I've learned in kind of working with the library and our project over the last year is that the reading rooms look in different ones because some are, you know, it's obvious it's prints and photographs or it's maps, but some of the other ones like the Folk Life Center or Science mm -hmm. and Tech actually has different collections of different items. Um, and so if you, if I think it's helpful if you search in different collections in different reading rooms, um, because you'll get very different results. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you do a search and it doesn't end up anywhere, but that's part of the research. And that's part and of the maybe if I can add, I don't know about the rest of you in audience land, but before I arrived at the Library of Congress, I didn't even know what a reading room was. Okay, like there's so much I did not know. I still don't know a lot of things, but uh, a reading room is basically a physical room where they're, they group the, the materials at the library by a general topic. 
And then you have these resource librarians that are just amazing, phenomenal specialists in that. So if you're thinking, well, that's really fun, Jen, but I'm sitting on my couch in Nebraska. So what you can do is if you go to our website and you go to, we have a drop down menu for the reading rooms. Once you figure out the general topic, if you're not finding anything in your searches, there's an ask a librarian feature. Mm -hmm. And there are real people. This is not a robot. There are real people on the other end that actually live and breathe. Like this is their, they mm -hmm. love this stuff. And you can ask your question as long as you don't need it in like a 24 hour turnaround, maybe two, three days, they will do diligence in finding anything. So if our culinary friend is trying to find more resources, I would contact the Ask a Librarian and in that in this, I, I'm almost positive it's the science, technology and business reading room. So please don't be shy about using it as a resource. These people, they live to serve in that manner. I also recommend thinking about it thematically, especially if you know that the types of foods that you want to center a lesson around have been around for a while. Mm -hmm. so like the, the changes to ice cream um, were pretty prevalent in the 19th century. They put oysters in them, which I have yeah. no understanding of, but yeah, lynching your head on that one now. Mm -hmm. um, the history of chocolate is also a really mm -hmm. long one to see how that's developed. And there are quite a few options available. Um, and so if you're thinking about specific types of food, mm -hmm. another way to do that search to see, kind of see what pops and to see what recipes may be available that you can think about historically or how they've changed over time. Um, and I, I suggest um, checking out a lot of museums. They've started moving into food history mm -hmm. um, and putting up a lot of things that they've collected. I know the F Henry Ford Museum has started to do that, so I would check them out as well. And to tag onto that for what Ashley made me remember, the free to use and reuse section that I highlighted during this, mm -hmm. they actually have a really great link to posters on ice cream. So if you were gonna enter into the study of ice cream in a different way, there's like an art format you might be able to tap into for students. Mm -hmm. All right, all kinds of things. Maybe we're hungry because we're talking about <laughs> <laughs> well, Let's shift to another question. <laughs> Go ahead, Ashley, what do we have? All right, I have got a question that says, um, if a source has copyright, does that mean we can't use it? So if we can tap into those copyright questions for a second, that would be great. So first of all, I am not a lawyer. I am not a lawyer. But when you look at any uh, primary source item that's digitized on the library site, if you get to see it in its entirety and it's blown up, that's going to be a good a good signal that likely you shouldn't have copyright issues. But to make sure, and I would show you, but I'm afraid I'm going to lose my connection. You scroll down to the bottom of that item page, and there's a copyright information link. Um, the Library of Congress, many of you might know or not know, actually houses the Copyright Office for the United States government. So if you have any question about using something, your first line of defense is looking at the copyright information under the bibliographic record beneath the item. And that's all on the same page. You just scroll to the bottom. If you have any questions, you can contact the copyright office. Um, if you come across a thumbnail sketch, like I mentioned earlier, and you cannot enlarge it from, from your couch as you're sitting and researching, big clue that there's copyright restrictions. It doesn't mean you can't use it, but there are, the donors to the different collections or how the library received them dictate the copyright protocol. So like for example, the NAACP papers that are held by the manuscript division are phenomenal, but they have certain rules of how you access them and if you can use them and, and how that works. So if you're encountering kind of some limitations that you're really committed to getting access to it, follow the links on the bottom of the bibliographic record for the copyright, and then contact the copyright office and they can give you some really great tips. Mm -hmm. Well, I would also encourage teachers to remember, it's all about how you're using it. Mm -hmm. Well, oftentimes if you're using these in your classroom, if students are using these in a history day project, they're gonna fall under that educational fair use. Mm -hmm. um, that is okay, well, that's why we tell students, it's perfectly fine to use a source provided that you give appropriate credit. So maybe on a student website, you have a tagline, this is from the Library of Congress, and here's the number, and then it should show up in that annotated bibliography. And if you're doing that, it's fair game. It's when you don't do that, mm -hmm. you kind of plop the picture in there, that it becomes an issue where we get into kind of that realm of plagiarism. Um, but that's why citations are important. And again, 
ask the librarian. That team is awesome. I have mm -hmm. requests thinking, I'm never getting an answer. And I have. And there are people there who know those collections like nobody's business. And I want to remind everyone, anything that's digitized by the library that you can freely access on our digitized collection is free of copyright. Mm -hmm. So what that means is if you and your students are going to produce posters or they're going to make little cards and sell them, you can do that. I would double check the bottom of the bibliographic record, but our rule of thumb has always been that anything that, that people can access in the full digital uh, format is completely free of copyright. Where it gets trickier for those of you that are like, but I can't find anything from 1960 that's printed photographs, just so you know, uh, copyright enacts itself and the limitations starting after 1923. So that's why you're going to see a lot of the collections that we put out free access and use tend to be events and people prior to that. And it's hard to like to find political cartoons post World War II. And that's why going into chronicling America is a backdoor way to find political cartoons that represent particular eras. All right, Ashley, what else do we have today? All right, let's see what we have here. Okay, so we have a teacher, the uh, Denise, who says, I love primary sources, but also find that students tend to struggle with analyzing them without sufficient background knowledge. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend for effective ways to convey background info via secondary sources to students prior to introducing uh, primary source sets in our virtual context? So do you want to, I can have ideas, but I feel like I've talked a lot. Do you want to go, Lynn? I'll throw a couple out and then punt some more in. Okay. You're absolutely right in that students have to understand context. That secondary source information is really important. And it's important in history. It's important in the classroom. So students need some background. They need something to read. Um, sometimes those LOC blogs can be really good because mm -hmm. they tend to be somewhere in the two to four paragraph range. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's maybe something that you write as a teacher. I would also suggest maybe a short video or a clip mm -hmm. documentary about an event is a neat way to kind of give students a background information that they might be able to watch in let's say the eight to 10 minute range to help them kind of understand the basics of an event. Um, and it's hard because this is something that's much easier for you to do in class where you can say, hey guys, all right, let me fill you in on this story. And once you have the background, then we're gonna pull out the political cartoon or the source. Mm -hmm. So think about what can students read what can students watch? Or, and in some cases we might need to say, okay, you know what? Maybe we need to not focus necessarily on the content that's going forward because the students don't have as strong of a grasp because they're not with you. Could they look at that primary source from a unit that you finished with them mm -hmm. because then they have the context and mm -hmm. would probably be more successful because I guess the great thing about primary sources is there's always far too many than you have time to work with in class. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is the chance to pull out of the list of, I really wanted to get to this and didn't have time file. So Jim, what other suggestions might you suggest? Well, I'm a huge fan. I understand this, trust me, because I struggle with it as a classroom teacher. How can I get kids to have background knowledge? I love primary sources because they allow kids to see themselves in history. They become the driver and have agency in their own learning. And because of that, I'm a big fan of using the primary source first now, I know in saying this, it's hard to do in an asynchronous environment, but exposing them to the primary source first, generating the questions, and then using those questions as an interest point back to the secondary source that gives, gives them some bridge as to why they're reading something, a purpose for reading. Um, and then I think then a strategic revisiting the primary source of, okay, now you have some background knowledge. How do we apply that? What questions does this primary source answer? Now, even with this background knowledge, what doesn't it answer? And then as a teacher, I kind of see it as a sandwich. You give the primary source, you offer the background knowledge in like Lynn was suggesting, short quality videos or a short reading that you provide them. And then you sandwich back with the primary source and then kind of rinse and repeat. Because then I think the more primary sources that are related to a particular topic, but in different formats, maps, mm -hmm. manuscripts, uh, you know, excerpts from a court ruling, whatever you're doing. I think that's helpful. Um, I do really like, and, and different organizations have different things to use. I like our primary source analysis tool, which I highlighted, and you'll find that on the teacher's page. Um, what I think would help kids in a remote learning is if you can pull questions off those teacher's guides and use those to 
prompt the kids for their analysis individually. So you might have students that don't need those prompts, but most kids need to understand what is the ob observed section of the primary source mean? What is the reflection? Um, what is the cue, the question section? And I think if you could do a quick overview video of demoing, I think aloud yourself for them in the primary source analysis, that might help that be a richer experience individually for them. And then they approach the secondary source with that analysis and then come back to it and see if they've expanded their learning. All right. Well, I have Jen, this next question is specifically to you. Okay. Um, it's about the transcription project that the mm -hmm. library is working on. One of our teachers would like to know if it's on grade level for sixth graders with modifications or accommodations. I think they gave an age limit, or not a limit, but an age recommendation of 12 and up. Um, I, I, as the teacher, if, if I'm going to use it for a younger grade, I don't, I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I would probably do a little bit more of the management of that. I might go in and select the specific source and not give the kids the freedom to that. I think this is where background knowledge for a younger learner is going to be even more important. Uh, and giving them that depends on where the kid's reading level is at. Um, maybe it might be better before they go into the transcription that a teacher find uh, or we can make recommendations a primary source for that grade level of something like Lynn was saying that they've already learned about a subject find a primary source that would fit into that background knowledge and go and just maybe it's four sentences and have the kids practice on that before they go in the transcription project um, they're just recommending both on content and then the cursive which let's be real high schoolers have just as much trouble as sixth graders with cursive um, I would really recommend, I think there's a lot more scaffolding and supports that would be needed for the younger learners, um, but that's not to say you're not going to have older learners that also need that too. So the recommendation is 12 and up in terms of age, but that's a broad recommendation and you know your kids. Right. Let's see what else we've got in this queue. A lot of really great recommendations coming in from teachers on other topics. So if you are looking for ancient and world history stuff, okay. just check out the answered questions. Mm -hmm. um, and also just other options that people are feeding off of what Jen and Lynn have contributed. So make sure you're checking out that Q&A for other teacher recommendations as well. All right. Lynn, this one's a little more towards you, but I figured it's also a great way to promote um, something that we have forthcoming from the library. Uh, any suggestions for collections or topics from LOC that would work for 2020-21 History Fair theme? Oh yeah, so we're getting ready for 2021 Communication and History, the Key to Understanding. Um, I'll give a little hint that in the upcoming theme book, which comes out in June, we will have uh, an article from several of the key members on the team where Jen works at the LOC uh, that talks about some different digitized collections and also some kind of twists on topics. So uh, I'll leave that as a little hint, but I will also say that we are working very hard to create materials digitally for students to help them access different collections. Um, honestly, I think there are literally thousands of topics within the LOC uh, I would also suggest if you want a sneak peek, since we opened up and let students start research a little early this year, if you go to nhd.org slash theme book, that's where our current theme book lives. But there's a little blue button on the side where you can access the 2021 theme narrative. And that I think will get you started, give you some tips and ideas. And I'll also mention that we are working on right now for release during the national contest, a short video. Think of it as like, a theme introduction video for classrooms. We're looking at it to be about five minutes long, something that will hopefully spark some ideas. And we're kind of highlighting some really cool resources um, and collections that are scattered throughout our theme book from various partners. So from the Library of Congress, from the Smithsonian, from the National Postal Museum, the oh, National Museum of American Diplomacy. Like there's literally just more, I we were working on the script this week and, there were so many ideas we had to say, okay, we got to cut this down because this is going to be a 15 minute video. So we are working with that. Um, I, you know, it's not quite the same as getting to do that theme workshop live at the national contest, but we're actually excited because we're going to be able to give you a resource that you can directly use with your students mm -hmm. to hopefully inspire and give them some really cool ideas moving forward into the fall. 
Sorry, I talk with my hands. They tell me that all the time. <laughs> That's okay, I do too. All right. Anything else in the queue before we wrap? Not as of right now, I'm waiting for um, an update from one of the teacher questions, but that's okay. If we don't get to your question, we will answer it post. So um, don't worry about the fact that your question didn't get answered if you didn't respond in time before we wrap up, that's okay. Um, but as of right now, keep those suggestions coming in the Q&A and I think that might be it unless we get some of the next few seconds because the minute I say that we're gonna wrap up the Q&A is when I get that's like- That's usually when somebody pops in. All right, well then, Let's, I'm going to share one thing just in case we'll give the person one more minute here. We've got one more in our series. It's the last one and I'm excited about this one. Last one, next Tuesday, we just got this confirmed. Mm -hmm. We're going to work with Don McKinnon, who's a digital producer at Florentine Films. Um, probably the most famous filmmaker who works at Florentine Films is Ken Burns. And I know a lot of you out there are Ken Burns nerds. Uh, so the Ken Burns organization called Unum. Uh, is working to put together a digital library of multimedia resources, which we think will help provide some really cool resources for you to work with with your students now, but also going into the next school year. Because I think we're kind of at that point where we might be thinking about right now, but we're also starting to kind of project out to say, hey, what kinds of things do I want to integrate in my classroom mm -hmm. when we return back in September and October into next winter? So this is going to be the last in our series. We're planning it for next Tuesday, same time, uh, noon Eastern, uh, 9 a.m. Pacific, 6 a.m. Hawaii time. So you can <laughs> register now. We also have it at the THV page. We will also do what we've done with the rest of our series, which is let this video process and get it posted along with the slides and the links and other resources that we find to help. All right, well, I wanna say a huge thank you to Jim Rydell, teacher in residence at the Library of Congress. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to all the teachers out there who are working so hard to provide so much for their students in a challenging time that none of us planned for or anticipated. Mm -hmm. I've been wrapping these by saying like, look, be flexible with your students. We all need a little grace and a little space right now. Be kind to yourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, you're doing the best that you can. You know that, your students know that, your students' parents know that. And my gosh, are they gonna be happy to see you back in the classroom same <laughs> as you are? Take advantage of this time. Be open to learning. Be open to trying. If this is the, isn't the time to try something new, I don't know what is. All right, we're going to wrap at this point. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a wonderful day and a great weekend. Thank you, everyone.